soccer cleats on? <clears throat> uh, soccer's transitioned to indoor, so nights have changed, and uh, and then I'm I'm helping with hockey sometimes. <laughs> It's like one of those things where, you know, if if you don't if I don't do it, I don't know if anyone else will. Yeah. Okay, Doug. Amherst Media is with us. It is 647. You have a quorum of the board. Uh the attendees are coming on in. We are recording. Yep, there I see it. And you are the co-host of the meeting. So we're good to go. All right. Thanks, Pam. You're welcome. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of November 6th, 2024. My name is Doug Marshall and as chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.47 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the planning on the, on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, where the Zoom link is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so, for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town's website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Uh, we believe that Bruce Coldham is absent this evening. Uh, Fred Hartwell. Fred Hartwell is present. Uh, Lawrence Klutz. Lawrence Klutz is present. Jesse Major. Present. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Johanna Newman. Present. And Karen Winter. Is Karen, is Karen there? All right, so I will just state that it looks like Karen has joined the Zoom meeting, but she does not have her camera on and is not responding to uh, my verbal uh, address. Okay, I guess we should just note when she actually shows up. Mm -hmm. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment, and I will see you, and I will call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. To the general public, the item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, time now is 6.51 um, and we can get going with our agenda. Let's see. All right, first item on the agenda is meeting minutes. And uh, I don't believe we had any meeting minutes in the in the packet. Is that correct, Pam? That is correct. I have a set ready to go, but I did not have a chance to proof them. 
Okay. Um, Jesse. Sorry, just clarification. I don't see an agenda either. Is that correct? You don't see an agenda at all? No. I mean, I can see the items, but I don't see the actual agenda. No, it doesn't really matter. I just need to, was wondering if we have to have it there for the meeting for some reason. Oh, you mean you don't see it on the screen? In the electronic on the packet. packet? It's not in the folder. It's not in the electronic packet, which, you know, all the substantive pieces are there, but. It's I just meant for posting requirements. It's, it's posted with the meeting posting. So, yeah, okay. I, I must have neglected to do that. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Fred? Yeah, I uh, just uh, now went on the town website and uh, downloaded the uh, the minutes, and, and I just printed them out for myself just now so I can uh, verify that that approach works and they were not part of the packet. Uh, you mean the agenda was... The agenda was not part of the packet. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for letting us know that. I'm going to step off just for a second so I can go ahead and post that. Okay, and Nate. Nate just, Nate just emailed us. Thanks, Nate. I'm, I'm going to put it in the packet. Okay. All right. So we'll go on to the public comment period. Time now is 6.53. Uh, I generally uh, list the attendees uh, that I see on the Zoom call at this time. And the folks that I see are Bruce Carson, Christine Brestrup, Elizabeth Veerling, Jennifer Taub, Ken Rosenthal, and Maura Keane. All right, do any of those people want to make a public comment about something not on tonight's agenda at the moment? All right, uh, whoops. All right, so I see Ken uh, Rosenthal's name and since Pam has stepped away, I will click on the allow to talk button that I see and we'll see if Ken can actually make his comment. Ken, hello. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. You did it, and I appreciate it. And again, right. thank you. You for, have three minutes. I, I'll take less. I want, I want to tell you, again, I appreciate you telling us who from the public is present. This afternoon, I sent to uh, Mr. Malloy and to you, and with apologies to Mr. Klutz, because inadvertently I left you off the list. I will rectify that shortly. A comment about Barry Roberts' proposed building at 55 South Pleasant Street. And I hope you will reintroduce that subject. I, In that paper that I sent you this afternoon, I gave you my reasons for why I thought it needed to be reconsidered and the decision changed. And I hope you will find a way to reconsider it. I know it's not on the agenda tonight. I don't know how to get it onto your agenda. So I leave that to you. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'll okay, thank you, Ken. Um, I guess we, well, despite the fact that I said we don't usually respond to public comments, uh, first of all, I haven't seen Ken's email and that's probably because I haven't checked it in a while. Um, but I did see uh, um, a couple of other, uh, at least one other, actually two other emails uh, from uh, people about that topic. And I did plan to bring it up later, uh, probably under old business. Um, and uh, Lawrence, if we bring that up, I expect we'll need you to recuse yourself. You may have already gone to your parenting duties at that point, but if you haven't, we may invite you to do so. Um, so uh, I see your hand up. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Yeah, I was, I was just gonna, uh request um uh mr rosenthal that you not uh, that you also not send that email to me i'm i'm recusing myself from any discussion of this or consideration of this project as a as an employee of amherst college okay. uh, mr marshall uh, do you want me not to send it to him I, I wouldn't expect that he could take action but i thought for information 
it might well, be. Well, um, actually, what I like is for the members of the public to send their comments to our staff. And um, that, you know, we have received several emails from a member of the public who is not on the planning board at this time, uh, has previously been on it. And it, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't really like having the, the emails sent directly to the board. I prefer they go through the staff. So um, for future reference, Ken, if you could send things to, to Nate or and, and or Pam, that would be the ideal communication uh, path for those kinds of things. Thank you, sir. I'm, I'm sorry for getting off the path and I'll try to get That's back. That's all right. That's all right. And if you could share that with uh, other people, that would be great too. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. I'm going to click uh, mute for Ken. Um, we'll see if that works. And um, let's see. Okay. Um, I don't see any other members of the public with their hand up at this point. And um, if I am wrong about that, uh, now's your chance to put your hand up. And I see Karen Winter has uh, turned on her camera. And Karen, you have arrived. Yeah. Okay, time is 6.58. Okay, um, so we've gone through public comment, and uh, at this point I see two hands, Nate and then Fred. So Nate, why don't you go first? Sure, yeah, I was just going to mention for everyone, typically we ask emails through staff for two reasons. One is uh, we don't provide email addresses of board or committee members. You know, we, we'll provide information that's public, like name and address, and if there's a listed phone number. But, you know, if someone emails me and says, oh, I'd like to email, you know, Fred Hartwell, I'd say, you know, email it through me and then I can let Fred know if he wants to, you know, write back through his email, sure, for instance, right? But we're not, we don't provide that information out um, to anyone really. And then second is that, you know, an email could start a conversation outside of a public meeting. And that's, you know, it's a, there's a risk there that it could be, you know, someone um, provides a comment, replies all, and then there's another comment and it becomes a serial conversation that violates open meeting law. And so, Typically, when staff writes to board and committee members, we ask that, you know, they would only write back individually to staff, and then we can share the comments back out in that manner. But really, it, you know, that way it, it keeps it from becoming a conversation amongst board members. Um, and then, you know, every, you know, those emails would then be posted to a, a packet um, just so it becomes public. But, you know, that, that those are the reasons why we, you know, typically ask, you know, any, any comments to go through staff, just so everything is you know, pretty clear that process doesn't, you know, conflict with open meeting law. Okay. Uh, Fred. I, uh, oh, <laughs> my bad. I didn't lower it. Sorry. Okay. All right, and I see Pam is back with us. All right. All right, so uh, at this point, it's uh, 7 o'clock. We can go. Actually, we've got five minutes to kill. So um, <clears throat> we usually jump later in the agenda to see what uh, we want to talk about. And I guess I'm feeling like, although I said I wanted to bring up the uh, 4555 South Street, South Pleasant Street project um, in old business. I think it's better in the general housing discussion. Um, but in any case, uh, let's let's talk about Pam. Is there any old business other than that topic, uh, not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance? Not that I'm aware of. Nate, how about you? Uh, you're you're muted, Nate. No, I don't. I don't have anything either to add. Okay. Uh, do either of you have anything for new business? 
Not tonight. Yeah. Not okay. tonight. All right. Um, Form A in our subdivision applications? No, not tonight. All right. Upcoming ZBA applications. I'm not aware of anything new. I did see a big packet on Jacinta's desk, but um, I don't, I think that they're still immersed in the Wayfinders project moving along. Um, midway, Nate, would you say? Yeah, no, I think it's actually past the midpoint. So we're uh, nice. next week, the ZBA will t be talking about waivers and maybe even conditions, start looking at conditions for the project and then you know, probably a few more, uh, you know, hearings for going through the conditions and getting a decision ready. Okay. And then Shootsbury Road Solar will be coming back in December and like, or is it December? And likely um, requested to be extended again. So at some point, you know, the planning board had looked at that project a while ago. Maybe you'd want to see it again if it takes a different, you know, shape and different site layout and everything. There was the preliminary subdivision plan presented a, a bit ago to freeze the zoning on that property or properties. And so, you know, when it comes back, probably in January or February, the board may want to um, have a presentation again about that. Okay. Upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications. Anything, Pam? Um, I told you about the two that are, are, they're in the review, they're being put into the system. Um, that is the work being proposed for the high school track upgrades. Um, and then also we have a preliminary subdivision plan that has been submitted for 4422 Amity Street. Um, and we think both of those, we're going to try to get them on the agenda for the first meeting in December. So that's December 4. Mm -hmm. All right, still a couple minutes till 7.05. So uh, a committee and liaison reports. Bruce is obviously absent, uh, no report on PVPC. Uh, Lawrence, uh, you must be in the thick of things on CPAC. Yeah, we've got our uh, our first uh, meeting tomorrow, um, uh, considering or, or looking at some, some proposals. So should be fun. I'm looking forward to... to Diving in. How many proposals are there? There's 11 or I mean, 11 or 12, right? Something like a dozen. Yeah, there are a dozen. And I think we're uh, we're hearing about um, four or five of them tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. So should be fun. OK. Uh, Karen, anything on DRB? No, nothing new. OK. All right. Um, See, at the moment, I don't believe I have any report of chair. Nate, anything you want to say about a report of staff at this point? We can come back to it later if yeah, you want. Yeah, I don't have anything either. All right, so we'll hold off on our adjournment. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're not going to get out quite this fast. Um. My computer does say 7.05. Yeah, they just rolled over on mine. OK. OK. All right. Um, OK, we have a public hearing on a site plan review. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SBR 2024-11, U Drive Amity, comma, LLC, University Drive at Amity Street, continued from August 7th and September 18th in 2024. Request site plan review approval under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw to redevelop existing commercial space into an 85 residential unit uh, and commercial space mixed use development, including parking, landscape, lighting, and stormwater infrastructure. Uh, parcels 13B, 18, 27, 28, and 54 in the BL zoning district. Um, is there any board member disclosure? Um, 
So let's see, I'm seeing uh, Pam in the notes that the applicant has requested to continue this hearing. Uh, I think I, the, the, the agenda I have says November 20th, but I think I saw some correspondence that they actually wanted to move it to some point in December. Is that correct? That is correct. It is December 18th is my understanding. Can you confirm that, Nate? Yes, yeah, so they, um, you know, this project has been reviewed by the Conservation Commission. There are a number of comments and they'll, there, there will probably be some site changes that they haven't done yet. And so the, Con the Conservation Commission will look at it uh, in November and then um, maybe in early December. So, you know, the, the applicant has requested December 18th. That was a, a good day. That way, you know, at this point, hopefully the Conservation Commission will be comfortable with what's presented and the planning board can move forward. Okay. All right. Uh, board members, are there any conversation? Is there any conversation you want to have about this project before we have a motion to close or to continue rather? Uh, not seeing any hands. Um, are there any members of the public that want to comment on this? Okay, I see you, Jace, Jesse. Um, members of the public, if you have any comments, why don't you raise your hands at this point while Jesse is making his statement? Jesse? I was just going to move to continue until oh, December. Okay. All right. Well, um, then I will accept that motion. I don't see any hands from any of the public. Johanna? I'll second the motion. All right. What what time on twelve eighteen? Do you want to say six fifty five? Do we have other projects already on that agenda? We do not. No, I think the um, given the um, the start and the continuation of the University Drive overlay with the CRC, um, that probably won't be on the eighteenth. There's one potential new site plan review application, which probably won't be ready until the new year. So on the 18th, it could be another discussion of housing and the ADU bylaw. Uh, you know, if, unless you know, there's something else that may you know could come up in the in the interim. But I don't, I don't. There's nothing I know about right now. All right. So Nate, um, if we want you present for that conversation, how early could we continue this hearing to? I mean, we could continue it to 6.45 or 6.30, go on to. All right. Well, how are people finding the 6.45 start? I know that we I've seen several people show up earlier than that, forgetting that we were going to 6.45. Uh, do you like 6.30? Should we just revert to that? I'm seeing Johanna, yes. Jesse, I thought that was a kind of a no. I was saying I show up early by mistake. I like 6.45 better though. Oh, but you do? Okay. On the calendar says 6.30, I show up. So that's my, prob that's my problem. Though. Okay. Fred, I see your hand. My preference would be 6.45. All right. All right. Well, at least during this period where we don't seem to have a very dense schedule of uh, topics to get through, maybe it's fine to stick with 6.45. Um, so in that case, um, let's see, we, we usually have a few things to go through uh, in terms of minutes and public comment. Um, maybe we should, we should extend this to uh, say 650 on the uh, 18th. Does that seem reasonable? Okay, so um, Jesse, you made a motion. Uh, you will you accept an amendment yeah. to set the time at six fifty? Yes. I do right. indeed. And Johanna, you're okay with that uh, from a second point of view? Great. Okay. So uh, again, any last comments about this before we vote to continue? Okay. I will say just quickly, nothing has changed since when it was presented. You know, now a bit ago. So on the 18th, you know, we can ask the applicant to you know, if we want to give an overview again of the project uh, and then bring it forward. So it has been a while since the board has heard it. And so, you know, the in, the packet tonight has a lot of information uploaded if you're interested. So, you know, Pam brought every, you know, the information forward. So, the, you know, the plan, stormwater report, all of that is in uh, this evening's packet if you want to look at it. 
nothing has changed yet. I guess the the reason why it's continued is it's anticipated that the site plan will change um, for the board to look at. The buildings themselves won't change, but for instance, the number of parking spaces or other things may. Uh, so right now it's not anticipated that the number of units or buildings will change, but you know, parking, uh, site design, stormwater, all those things uh, may change, so. Okay. All right. Um, in that case, we'll go ahead and have our have our roll call or vote on the continuation. Starting with you, Fred. I vote yes. Thank you, uh, Lawrence. Yes. And Lawrence. Um, just because I'm not sure, you've kind of been attending a little bit sporadically. Um, have you either listened to all of the uh, previous hearings we've had on this topic? You know, on Zoom, so you're you, you're fully. Yeah, so I I was I was I was present for one of the hearings. Uh, I've I'm I'm not sure if I missed one along the way. I I know I've had to miss a couple of meetings recently for child care issues. Yeah. Yeah, so I can, I can. I just want to make sure you're eligible to participate. Um, and um, so, okay, thanks for your vote. <laughs> uh, if you, if you have, you know, those dates that I read, August 7th and September 18th, if you could just check that you were present or that you listened to the recording of that portion of the meeting. And I think you have to send an email maybe to Nate to say that you missed that one, but you have, you know, you're certifying that you've uh, listened to the recording, then I think you're fine to participate. I, I will do that. Yep, I will do that. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Jesse. Aye. And Johanna. Aye. Karen. Aye. I'm an aye as well. Six in favor, one absence. The motion carries. So we will continue this hearing to September, uh, December 18th at 6.50. All right. Um, moving on. Nate, uh, you want to talk about accessible dwelling units. The time is 7.15, 14 rather. Sure. Later this afternoon, I emailed the draft uh, bylaw and I can share it and walk through it. And so, you know, there was a webinar was it just this week or last week? I <laughs> time goes by. Um, ironically, some of the information that was presented there was inconsistent with the earlier webinar that I attended. Um, but you know, I, I still put together a draft. You know, I think the idea would be we have you know an accessory dwelling unit by law now, and uh, you know there are some provisions in it and standards and conditions that are you know would now. Be in violation of the new state law but the building commissioner you know could still issue a permit and follow what regulations we have that aren't inconsistent with the state definition and state and state you know law so it's not like we don't have anything um in place and so even now you know if we moved an adu by a law forward i'm not sure we could get it ready by february 2nd i, I still think we should you know continue the discussion and, and move something forward um, but, you know, we do have something in place. So that's, that's important. You know, there are some communities that don't have anything. And so then all of a sudden they would either have to quickly get something or, you know, the building commissioner would just issue a building permit. So in our current bylaw, we have general conditions and requirements, you know, that um, there'd be a management plan provided to the building commissioner, uh, trash and certain things, mechanicals be screened, lighting be dark sky compliant that if feasible entrances are put on the side or the rear of the building, um, the massing is you know, inconsistent and smaller than the existing dwelling. So we have kind of reasonable regulations, which is the phrase in the legislation. So we have things now that can be used if our bylaw, you know, if we don't have a new bylaw in place. Um, and so what I sent was, you know, kind of a proposal to remove the whole section of the bylaw, you know, Right now we have a few different categories of accessory dwelling units, you know, completely contained within a dwelling, attached and detached, and then we have general requirements. And the idea would be to just remove the whole section of the bylaw and then replace it with the new bylaw, as opposed to trying to strike out and 
wordsmith something. A few communities have done that. Um, I found their versions online and it's very confusing. <laughs> um, so the version I sent to you was, and I'll pull it up in a second, um, you know, staff has found probably a half dozen uh, bylaws that other communities have proposed bringing to town meeting or to town council this fall. Um, KP law provided three templates. Uh, there, you know, most of them are pretty, you know, some are pretty good, some are somewhat generic. And so, you know, reading through that, we came up with um, a bylaw that would follow the format we currently have, you know, and if you find some online, you can share them with me. I mean, everyone does them a little differently. You know, they might have the definition of an ADU in the definition section. They might have something else in another section. We have it all within our accessory um, dwelling section. So we're not, you know, we're not spreading it out. Um, it's all part of article five, which is accessory uses. So uh, it would still be the same um, section in the bylaw. And with that, I guess I, I can just um, share the screen if that's visible for everyone. And yep, so the proposal is right to remove 5.011 and just replace it with this new section. Uh, we have a purpose, and this is actually from the existing bylaw. Um, you know, accessory dwelling units are intended to meet the changing housing needs of owner-occupied households, including housing for relatives and other associated um, with the household in the provision of small individual rental units. We can modify that, but you know, it's nice to have a purpose. Uh, the applicability of it. So, you know, accessory dwelling units. Um, you know, shall be located on the same lot as a principal single family dwelling in zoning districts that allow single family dwellings. And so that's from the state definition. So, you know, an accessory dwelling unit cannot be, um, you know, put on a property with a duplex or an apartment building or in a zoning district that, um, you know, doesn't allow single family homes. Uh, it needs to be accessory and used to the single family use of the property. So it really is an accessory use. Uh, and the lot shall have an existing single family dwelling in order for the creation of an accessory dwelling unit. Um, and so this is something that, you know, this phrase we added, you know, some, some communities haven't, and I've heard that some people might actually want to do an ADU first and then build a single family home after the fact. Uh, but really if the ADU is supposed to be a sec, you know, accessory to the single family home, I think it's important that we can state that the single family home needs to be in existence. And so, um, you know, and I sent this out so, you know, anyone can send comments you know, if there's nothing now. Um, the definition, so this definition is really uh, taken right from Mass General Law. It's a self-contained residential dwelling unit inclusive of sleeping, cooking, and sanitary facilities on the same lot as the principal single family dwelling subject to otherwise applicable dimensional and parking requirements that, and there's three sections here, maintains a separate entrance, uh, either directly from the outside or through an entry hall or corridor shared with the principal single family dwelling, sufficient to meet requirements of the state building code for safe egress. Uh, here is the provision about size, is not larger in floor area than half the floor area of the principal single family dwelling or 900 square feet, whichever is smaller. Uh, and it is subject to additional restrictions found in this bylaw. And um, so, you know, the difference right now is we allow up to a thousand square feet in a, um, as an accessory dwelling. And we don't actually define it necessarily this way. And so, what most communities are doing now, they're just putting this state definition in as their definition as an accessory dwelling unit. Um, I think every model I've seen does that. We said in the past we have, we allow accessory dwelling units now that are bigger. And so some communities are calling them something else instead of ADU, they might call them like, um, I've seen like small residential unit or local ADU. Um, that being said, further down in the bylaw, we, I, I'm providing for larger ADUs up to a thousand square feet by special permit. And so that way they are still called ADUs. Uh, and then that way the ones that have already been permitted still have a permitting pass so they don't become non-conforming. I think you know, that's kind of the way the building commissioner would like to go as opposed to having two definitions, you know, a state definition of an ADU and then a local definition that has whole different 
criteria and permitting. Um, it just seems kind of odd to do that. Uh, Nate, I see Fred has his hand up uh, before you go on. Fred? Uh, yeah, uh, just a, a procedural thing. I'm, I'm, what would you think about uh, locating the definition in uh, Article 12? I just think, I think definition should, you know, generally be in the same place. Yeah, right now we don't. Uh, we just define ADU within the Article 5. So how we describe it becomes the definition. Um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I guess it depends on, you know, what the board thinks. I'm not, either way would work, I guess. What's nice about having it here is it's the only defined term. It would just be within the bylaw, you know, within the same section. It's a, you know. I haven't looked at the definitions in the bylaw in a while, but isn't that, are they as extensive and have as many conditions associated with them typically as this? This seems a little more involved than just defining a word. Right, and so, no, I mean, we define, in the bylaw, we, you know, the most of the definitions are pretty straightforward. Some have these subparts, uh, but not, you know, I will say that the definition section, you know, there can be, there can, there can be a lot of defined terms, right? And some are, um, usually to me, it would be like, if it's unique to zoning, it's nice to have a defined term. If it's kind of a commonly understood phrase or word, I think that it sometimes it doesn't necessarily need a sep separate definition. Um, unless we, you know, there's something specific to it. So in this case, you know, maybe, you know, we, we do have that. We define a dwelling unit, we define an attached dwelling unit, a detached dwelling unit, and then like a two family, you know, detached dwelling unit. So we could have that there as an accessory dwelling unit, you know, as within those kind of those definitions in the bylaw. Okay. Uh, Fred, did you have anything else? Uh, not really. I, that would be my preference in this case, and, and for that reason. Okay. Uh, Karen? I'm wondering, Nate, why it's now 900. Didn't we just fairly recently change from, I think it was 800 to 1,000? Why did you come up? Why, why 900? So this, this definition, the 900 and all this language is, is by the new state law. So we, you know, that's why, you know, we 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 can't we can't put in this definition, you know, something other than nine hundred. Otherwise, it would it wouldn't be compliant. Um, we can't allow bigger units through a different permitting process. But if we want to define an ADU that's up to a thousand square feet, like I said, it wouldn't actually meet. It would no longer be an accessory dwelling unit. We'd have to call it like it. a local accessory dwelling unit, or I don't know some, you know. Um, but it wouldn't be an ADU according to state law. So really what we're doing is we're updating our bylaw to comply with these new state laws that are taking effect, uh, you know, February 2nd of next year. Okay. Uh, and so the 900 square feet here is, you know, calculated as gross square feet in accordance with the building code. So that doesn't include, you know, common hallways, porches, basements, or other areas. So, you know, if someone were to build an accessory dwelling unit and had a full basement, you know, what's not livable or habitable space is not part of this um, 900 square feet. And then, you know, this is something that we added an accessory dwelling unit may be contained within an existing single family dwelling, attached to an existing single family dwelling, detached as a separate building or within a detached structure. You know, as a, you know, you know we say parenthetically, for example, above an existing detached garage. And so, you know, that's how we kind of classify them now. And the state doesn't do that. And so essentially any variation will meet that definition for the state as long as it's not, you know, 900 square feet and has its own entry and follows code. So it could be any anything. It could be half inside, you know, half outside as a new addition. It could be completely detached. And so the way we define it now and permit it as contained, attached or detached, is no longer relevant. It's just an accessory dwelling unit. Um, Nate, minor thing, your IE should be an EG. 
Yeah. If you, if you mean, for example. And then I was actually thinking, do we just delete it? Um, uh -huh. I don't know if I'd actually keep this in if we as this moved forward as a bylaw, but. Okay. Since you mentioned it, we can do that. Um, and then we have to allow by right one accessory dwelling unit that meets the state definition on a property with a single family home. So, you know, here it is, an accessory dwelling unit by right. Uh, one accessory dwelling unit shall be permitted by right on a single family property that meets the definition above and meets the general requirements of this bylaw. And so we still can have re reasonable regulations is what it says uh, in our local bylaw. So down below we have like 20, 20 conditions as general requirements. Uh, we, 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 added, we added this in order to qualify as a buy right accessory unit, the proposal shall conform to the dimensional standards of the zoning bylaw and be on a lot with only one other residential dwelling unit. Uh, it's just, you know, it helps clarify things for the building commissioner and for staff. So, you know, what I will say is that you, we could allow accessory dwelling units, one or two or more by site plan review and define it. And we could allow accessory dwelling units by special permit. And then we have a few here, but for site plan review, you know, we would define, we could say that, you know, the, the planning board is the permit granting authority and with site plan review, if we're allowing one by right, um, we could allow two, for instance, by site plan review, and then put conditions on it about, you know, stricter conditions, possibly about owner occupancy or, um, you know, one community I've seen said that you could do two ADUs by site plan review if both of them combined are still 900 square feet or smaller. Um, uh, I had, you know, which are small, I thought, you know, what if you had a site plan review and one of the units had to be completely contained within the existing structure and the other one could be whatever, but, you know, essentially you wouldn't see, you still only really see one ADU. It does change the, you know, the intensity of the use on the property. Um, you could try to regulate how many occupants or bedrooms there are in these ADUs uh, if we're allowing the one so essentially, this right here meets the state def state regulation, state law. We don't have to do anything else. We could just, don't, we don't do anything here. I will say, Jesse, I see your hand, but because we've permitted some that are a thousand square feet and we have pre-existing non-conforming uses, I would still have this one right here. Um, accessory dwelling units by special permit and it's through the zoning board. So dwelling units that are, you know, greater than half the floor area, uh, but no more than a thousand square feet. So that way, you know, ones that have already been permitted or if people want to go bigger, we allow that. And then accessory dwelling unit on a lot that has a single family dwelling that has a pre-existing non-conforming use. And so we have some of those in town. And so th that would be, you know, if you want to do kind of the minimum for the bylaw, here's what we have. We don't have to do anything with site plan review. We don't have to add anything else with special permit. You know, we could say you could do two ADUs on a property, not by site plan review, but by special permit. And here are these stricter requirements, you know, owner occupancy, height, massing, whatever, um, or we don't have to. Um, some communities are doing it. Some communities are saying you can have two or three and some are just keeping it the one. So for that for that first condition you've written there, you should make it somehow clear that the but no more than one thousand square feet applies to both of the options that you have listed here. Yeah. You know, I can imagine the lawyers, arguing over the or and whether the or is separating the entire sentence or just the two options. So, yep. um, Jesse. Yeah, a question, Nate. The first piece here that you're saying we could or cannot include the site plan review for these other options. I guess I'm missing the punchline on that. Like we would, why, why are some places doing that? Is this just to encourage? multiple ADUs? Yeah. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah. So I just want yeah, to make so sure I understand. Us, yeah. I mean, so some communities are just kind of doing this and then they're putting in general requirements and it meets the state and they're fine. A few communities are going the route and they're saying, well, we'll allow two ADUs on a property. Right. So, maybe, so they want to increase like density. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're viewing it as a way to increase even more than the right. single. Yep. Okay. So my idea, honestly, of keeping one, say, say we don't do this, right? Like yeah. I'm okay just deleting this. Yeah. I'm not I, I would that. I would I would agree. Like special permit, fine. I would take out that piece. And so honestly, I do like the idea of say allowing two on a property, one within the completely contained within the existing single family structure. Essentially that it's almost becomes an easier permitting path than our converted dwelling section in our bylaw. Right now you can do a converted dwelling if you have enough lot area. And then you have to do these calculations about how many grow square feet. And you know, it it actually is it, it's hard to use and most people don't use it. Um, but we could say, well, you could do a converted dwelling inside an existing one and still do another ADU. So you get three units on the property by special permit. We are gonna require owner occupancy. We're gonna require a management plan. And with a converted dwelling, we're saying you could in a big unit get up to four units. But here we're saying you're capped at three and it's still by special permit with an owner occupancy requirement, which is very similar to converted dwelling. And it's just one more option for say an owner or developer. I mean, maybe, I mean, honestly, if like, if we like this better, I, I almost find the converted dwelling section to be so confusing that I'd love to get rid of it or modify it. You know, we try to give incentives if it's historic preservation, it's, it's rarely used that way. Um, we have some percentage allowance to change floor area. Anyways, you know, there could be options here if we wanted to do something through special permit. Um, the state, there's been two interpretations of the state legislation. So in the workshop on Monday, they said that if you allow more than one on a property, it has to be by special permit, right? So there's no way you can allow two or more any other way except for special permit. The other interpretation of, there's another interpretation of that which doesn't necessarily require a special permit, but in any case, you know, it's something to consider. Do we want, you know, I think these two categories can stay, should stay. Do we want to add a third category? You know, I, again, I'm not, you know, we could say no. And so here's the other option. I think the AG's office will start to review um, probably this month, town meeting results where people are putting, you know, they've already been voting on this fall, starting in October on new bylaws to catch up with the state. And the hope is that the state and the AG's office will put out guidance probably, you know, probably in February, right? But at a point where most communities will probably have to go back and amend their bylaw. And so we could do a really simple bylaw now that we think is pretty clean. And then if we want to amend it next year, we could, right? Uh, you know, I, for instance, we have all these general requirements. Um, there's maybe one or two that the state may end up saying um, are unreasonable. Um, for instance, we, you know, one might be, we say, um, all leases on an accessory dwelling unit shall be no shorter than 12 months. You know, a number of communities have said that. I don't know if that's unreasonable or not. Um, you know, they might find that to be unreasonable. Um, we have, you know, some potential other general requirements that maybe they find to be unreasonable. You know, I don't, you know, um, but anyways, I see okay. Fred, you have your hand, but, you know, yeah, so Nate, I, I was waiting for Fred to put his hand up because you may not remember that he has a special affection for converted dwellings. Oh, he has subdivide, subdividable dwellings. Oh, really? Okay. Hey, Fred, you're yes. on. Yes, um, I would normally, you know, be totally in favor of uh, as much flexibility here as possible. However, there is a massive problem in that is of particular relevance to the town of Amherst. <clears throat> there is a massive problem with the... Uh, 
legislation, and that is it expressly disallows any conditioning on owner occupancy. And that makes me think we do, we should do absolutely nothing more than what the state is compelling us to do. Uh, because in this town, uh, that emasculates the, uh, you know, the, the proven method of uh, policing uh, uh, antisocial behavior uh, in, uh, in this market. So that, that's kind of where I, how I parse this right now. I am so appalled by that limitation in the state law that I'm inclined to do absolutely nothing more than we have to. All right. Thank yeah, I will, I will say that the interpretation has been that for the first ADU by right, you can't have an owner occupancy requirement, but if you were to allow more than one, you could then condition owner occupancy through the special permit process. So again, it may be that the state comes out with guidance and says, no, actually the way it means is you can't condition owner occupancy for any, you know, if you have more than one, but the way most communities are reading it is that for that first one, you can't, but if you allow more than one through a special permit process, you can put extra conditions on like owner occupancy for one, at least one of those units. Um, again, that's where, you know, the state hasn't provided any guidance on the legislature, you know, the legislation, like, is it, how clear does that actually say that? Okay. So, uh, you would like us to send you any further comments we have on this? Uh, we have the general, I see Fred had his hand raised again and Karen. Well, uh, Fred took us down and Karen's now got hers up. Karen? We can go through general requirements too once we get there. So there, you know, we can look at those. Yeah, Karen? I was gonna say that I, I increased, I do agree with Fred that this is the big problem is the lack of owner occupancy. And if you define it right now, Nate, as that's only the case with the first ADU, and if we allow more, we could require owner occupancy. But you know, once they're built, the state can again waive that, and uh, then you have, you know, chaos in Amherst. Okay. All right. Do you want to go through the? requirements or do that at a later meeting? Oh, no, I mean, we don't have, you know, other than the general housing discussion, there's not much else. So I, I think we can go through it. So for instance, if we want to do, you know, what, um, you know, what has been said, we would, we could do this. And so the bylaw would be, sorry for the scrolling, you know, the purpose, the applicability, the definition, and then all we're saying is there's one accessory dwelling unit permitted by right and it meets the state. We would have these uh, still just one accessory dwelling unit by special permit to, you know, as a safeguard against our um, pre-existing non-conforming uses. And because we have previously allowed them up to a thousand square feet. So that is the pathway there. And then we would just jump into the general requirements. Jesse, I, yeah. Uh, yeah so, so if we do this and then someone does want to build two or three, what's the path for them? Is there a path for them or just- No, nope. if no it's not there? allowed, it's a prohibited, so. Okay. Yeah, I, I support this, sure. Yeah, and you know, it could be that, um, you know, that the state comes out with guidance and interpretation of the, of the law and the regulation sooner that could help us in terms of how we want to do some of these conditions. Um, so anyways, for the general requirements, these apply to all ADUs, even the one by right. Um, and some of them get at things to just ensure that it, you know, when you read them that they stay, you know, as an ADU. So a lot with an accessory dwelling unit shall not be subdivided or split. It shall remain as one property with a single family dwelling and an accessory dwelling unit. 
the principal single family dwelling and accessory dwelling unit shall remain under this under single ownership and the ownership shall not be split into a condominium. The accessory dwelling unit shall be used exclusively as a residence. And so for instance, you know, if someone had an ADU and what if they wanted to then make it a home business or something, you know, so we're saying it really has to be a residential use. Uh, all leases on both the ADU and the princ principal single family dwelling shall be no shorter than 12 months. Um, the state does allow. Yeah. I'm sorry, the, uh, I guess it's number three where you talk about exclusively as a residence. Say I build an ADU and my mother uh, live, moves into it mm -hmm. and she loves to knit and she decides she wants to sell her mittens out of her house. Is that all right? Yeah, so in, in, in Article 5, we do define home-based um, you know, um, businesses. And so at the scale you were talking about, Doug, that'd be fine. At some point, you know, does it become a second uh, accessory use as a home-based business? Okay. Yeah. So that, I mean, it's, I, access, that, it's accessory use, so. Yeah, okay. It's not a principal use. All right, Jesse. Uh, I emailed you earlier, and it would be helpful as we go through these if you could point out what's a change and what's currently in our bylaws. So the only thing that's in our bylaw right now is this. So all these conditions down below are new additions. So that's in our bylaw, and everything else. And there's three or four conditions that are in our bylaw. Everything else is all new. So it's just every, all everything that all this is all new. Okay. Um, when we get to the ones that are the same, I'll highlight them. Okay, thanks. Um, accessory uh, dwelling. Hey, uh, Fred has his hand up too. Uh, yeah, I, the uh, you've got to do a little bit of work on the uh, leases for a year. Um, there's lots of different ways to establish tenancies uh a lease being one but there there are plenty of uh and, and and all of all of my uh rentals have always been by lease but uh there are uh, other ways uh that uh do not involve the creation of a lease and uh so uh, and i don't know uh, you know, a lot of these are traditionally month to month, and uh, so uh, it, it, what's your opinion, Nate? Does this disallow month to month tenancies? Yeah, so honestly, what I was going to say is the state allows communities to regulate. Um, ADUs to not be short-term rentals. And we Amherst doesn't regulate short-term rentals now. Uh, I put this condition in here in part because a few communities are doing this. And oftentimes the ZBA will put this as a condition uh, for, um, for say non-owner occupied duplexes or properties. Honestly, um, you know, if, if right, I agree, if, if we, think it will become problematic and it's really not necessary, then we can remove it. Um, so, but it is, so it's something, you know, it's a, it's a conversation point. So some communities are trying to say they don't take the approach of regulating it as a short-term rental, but they will try to take the approach of having some other provision about the length of a, a, of a lease or tenancy. And I honestly, I don't have a strong opinion either way. Some of it would be because it's not owner occupied you know, is it a concern if, you know, um, both units are month to month rentals or not? Um, you know, so I, I you know, I, I think it's a, it's a good point you bring up, Fred, and something the board could consider, you know, how do we want to have something about, about this? Um, and it could be something, you know, some other requirements or conditions. Okay. Um, Jesse, you also have your hand up again. Thanks. Yeah, on that point, on the lease point, I I don't think practically it would have any effect because we're not going to enforce. There's no way to enforce this anyway. If someone wants to go month to month. 
I, I do think at some point we might want to consider the short term, you know, Airbnb preventing that, but I don't think it's an issue right now for our town, right? So no, it's, it's there's only been, you know, there's a, a number of units that are used, you know, seasonally or most of there's not a lot of short term rentals. We don't regulate them at all. And so, yeah. So anyway, on so this point, I think it's fine to be in there. I don't think it'll have any effect on what people actually do. I mean, if we think it's not necessary, it's easy enough to. Yeah, I'd rather not have it there than have it be there and, and not be somehow regulated or something right. we expect people to pay attention to. Right. Because we do require it to be, if it's rented, to be part of the rental registration program. So we'll you know, have some record of it anyways. I mean, if there's enforcement issues, we can go and enforce any, you know, any noise violation or any, you know, they have to submit a management plan. So there's ways to, you know, try to manage the property without necessarily trying to get into the lease terms. Okay. Let me just check with Fred. You have your hand up again? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, okay. I attended that seminar uh, on uh, Monday, I think it was. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> this uh, the, the legislation very specifically addresses uh, the, uh, the, the short-term rentals. And there is a... Uh, one of the things that came out in that seminar was that there is a short, the concept of a short-term rental is the subject of specific uh, legislation in state, already in state law. And they gave the section, I don't have the section in front of me. I did write it down. I have it somewhere. I think it's 64 D or something, but there, that is uh a, a subject that is uh, has to correlate exactly with uh, a, a different part of state law regarding short-term rentals. Okay. And now I'll lower my hand. Okay. Yeah, I'm not proposing to put anything in here about short-term rentals at this time. I think if the town were to develop a short-term rental bylaw or regulations, we could adapt it and fit it for ADUs, but at this time we don't, um, you know, what Jesse said, it's a, it's really an enforcement issue and, you know, we don't go in and inspect, you know, proactively try to inspect every time someone says it could be a short-term rental. It's just not. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what's highlighted in this one, the highlighted piece is in the current bylaw, but the rest of the text is new. Uh, accessory dwelling units shall follow all dimensional standards in the zoning bylaw. However, as an accessory use, uh, the units are exempt from the additional lot area family requirements of table three. And so, you know, right now we'd say, depending on what zoning district you're in, you know, you have to have an additional 2,500, 4,000 square feet. We don't require that now for an accessory dwelling unit because it's not, we're not considering it another, you know, principal um, use or another uh, you know, main unit. So we don't um, require that now. And so we're not proposing to change that. Um, and we're saying that all other dimensional standards will apply. Some communities are writing their own new dimensional standards for ADUs. Maybe they have like an additional setback or, or something. We're just saying that what we have in our bylaw now applies and we're not proposing new, new standards. Uh, Jesse, your hand was up. Um, accessory dwelling units shall meet all of the applicable codes and regulations. And so this is kind of a generic thing, but, you know, um, they still have to meet septic, uh, and state requirements. If it's on septic, they have to meet fire and building code. So typically you can't have an, you know, a detached ADU that's closer than 10 feet to another structure by code. Um, you have to have certain egresses and landings outside. You have to follow our rental registration. We don't like we don't typically list all these things in there, but we just have this kind of thing. We say it sim similarly now. We say something similar to this, just so it's a kind of a reminder to everyone. Um, the design review principles shall apply and be used by the permit granting authority. So if there's a special permit ADU, we have two. They can use the DRB, you know, design review principles. Um, here's where we have a few kind of. Um, uh, some design pieces that, again, the state says they need to be reasonable. So an accessory dwelling unit shall be smaller in scale, height and massing, 
Then the principal single family dwelling and shall be designed so that the appearance is compatible with the existing single family dwelling. We have the appearance compatible was highlighted in our bylaw now, the smaller in scale we don't. So we're putting that in there. Um, the state has said kind of like bulk kind of standards, massing height is reasonable. So we're not getting very specific. You know, some bylaws I've seen will actually say it can't be more than 20 feet tall or has to be only a single story. Um, that might be considered unreasonable because what if you have an existing garage and you want to put an ADU above the garage? Now it's two stories. So basically you're saying that that's not allowed. Um, so we're not getting really prescriptive. Um, so if, if I have a single one level house that has a fairly uh, low slope roof, you know, uh, I'm not going to make my ADU have only seven foot height, you know, interior room height just to keep it below the level of my other one. I mean, we say, you know, it's the height, I mean, yeah, smaller in scale. I, I see what you're saying. You could say such as height or massing or something to make it yeah. so that that's not absolute. Right, let me just, yeah. Let me just highlight that too. Yeah, I, I know, yeah, because it could be, um, right, I, yeah, I, I, I totally get it too, because it could be this, right? You have a, I'm gonna draw here, you know, if you're seeing it in a perspective, you have the roof of your house and then your ADU could just be a foot taller because the way, you know, the new, the, you know, like in my house, my ceiling's only seven, seven. And so to do a new addition on a full eight, you're actually gonna, the way they frame it up, it would actually be yeah. taller than my existing house by a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And so, uh, you know, again, communities are putting something like this in their bylaw. They're not, you know, like I said, some are going, trying to get really prescriptive. Most have some generic language, uh, a number of bylaws, and we have something similar in ours uh, about entrances, any new separate entrance, Outside, uh, serving the ADU shall be clearly secondary to the entrance of the principal single family dwelling. Uh, when an accessory dwelling unit has a separate exterior entrance or is a separate building, the ADU shall be accessible from a path or walkway. Um, there is a provision about uh, parking requirements if you're within a half mile of a transit station or other things. And so the way uh, you know, I spoke with the building commissioner, the way we read that, we actually don't have any of those in Amherst. And so we're basically saying that an accessory dwelling unit shall provide a minimum of one off street parking space on the lot. Um, shouldn't that be something like the applicant shall provide a minimum of one off street parking space sure. on the lot uh, to be associated with the accessory dwelling unit? or to be assigned to the occupants of the ADU or something? Sure, yeah. And then- It's um, possible you'd have an ADU and you, you wouldn't ever have a lease. You wouldn't rent it. You might have your you know, your 25 year old child live there. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, most, I mean, you know, if you're doing, if it's, if we're only saying you can do one ADU, I'm assuming most of those ADUs can be accommodated by the existing driveway and maybe, you know, some small uh, additional parking space. But, um, you know, I, we do say here, we have a few more things about parking. Parking shall not be allowed in the front setback, except for provided in 7002, which is, you know, two spaces. Uh, adequate off-street parking shall be provided as provided on a parking plan. Um, I did have in there, which I guess I don't have now. Um, I have seen where, let me just add it. Um, I may have- I see Fred has his hand up too. Yeah. The, a few bylaws have said no additional curb cuts. 
for ADUs so that you don't have, you know, two driveway aprons on a property and one just serving the ADU. Um, and so, you know, if that's something we want to consider, let me just put that in a different color. Um, then we can do that. Um, you know, I, I, it's kind of interesting to me. Be, I don't know if public works would allow a lot of curb cuts, you know, along a property, but we could be proactive and say, well, you know, if it's accessory, does it really need its own driveway? But um, okay, Fred. Uh, yeah, Nate. Uh, I I'd like you to say a little bit more about uh, how nowhere in Amherst. Uh, meets the exemption in state law due to proximity to uh, public transportation. Um, as uh, someone who owns rental property that is well within a half mile, not one, but two uh, uh, bus stops on the bus route, um, I looked at the state law and said, uh, it sure, sure as hell looks like uh, I'm. I would be tied into to that uh, limitation. So, could you say a little bit more about why you think, uh, you know, with the uh, robust uh, bus system we have in Amherst, why you think that no properties in Amherst uh, uh, are not covered by the uh, under the terms of the new legislation yeah so the legislation says you know if you're near um, within a half mile and then they say you know rapid transit commuter rail bus or ferry terminals or stations and so you know in the webinars you know i've attended in some of the faqs they've said well is a bus stop really a station and so a lot of people are saying no so like, you know, a bus station would be like Peter Pan in Springfield or, you know, some other bigger terminal, not a bus stop, right? So uh, some of this language was taken from the MBTA communities and how they were defining eligible locations in terms of uh, infrastructure and transportation. And so I don't think that when they, when, when they wrote this, you know, they say transit stations, they're not saying bus stops. To me, if they actually meant to say bus stops, they have this kind of long list of what is a transit station, a terry, you know, a ferry terminal, a commuter rail terminal. If they were going to say bus stop, I think they would have said bus stop in addition to a transit station. So I actually don't think Amherst has a transit station. We have a lot of bus routes and a lot of bus stops, but not a station. And so you know, I, I, could, I, I could be wrong, right? I mean, again, this could be where the state comes out with guidance and actually says, you know, bus stops are, are, are transit stations. But if I were reading the legislation right now, I would not think that like a Route 33 bus stop is a transit station. All right. Well, I'm, I'm uh, delighted to hear that. And I hope that they uh, clarify that in the regulations. Yeah. I, again, it's one of those things that, you know, if that's if um, if that's determined that a bus stop is, then this would say you know one off street parking unless the property was within a half mile of a bus stop. So basically, if you're within a half mile of that transit station, you can't require um, parking, right? Right. But okay. Um, just for the record, I do see Tar and La Raja's hand um but i think why don't we go through the rest of these conditions yep. and then we'll get to a public comment and then additional curb cuts i mean i like that i don't know if others like the idea of trying to put that in there in terms of you know a separate curb cut it's nice in concept you know but maybe your property doesn't right lend itself to that so we'll keep it highlighted um Oh, we do say this in our, so these, um, <clears throat> the rest of these, um, all these exist as general requirements in our existing ADU bylaw. So they can't be used for accessory lodging, um, right? So they have to, you know, um, the accessory dwelling unit and property shall be operated in accordance with a management plan that's submitted to the building commissioner. And so upon change of ownership, a new plan shall be filed. 
Uh, we require that now, we would continue to require that. And that does allow some enforcement mechanism. Uh, any dwelling unit on the property shall be rented and registered with the rental um, property bylaw. All exterior lighting shall be designed and installed to be shielded, downcast, and dark sky compliant to avoid light trespass under trespass under adjacent properties. Um, we say on-site storage and management of waste and recycling shall occur on the interior of the dwelling within an attached garage or other accessory outbuilding or screened appropriately from public view. There shall be no freestanding dumpster or storage unit associated with a property regulated under this section, except on a temporary basis in association with construction or similar temporary purposes. And so we do have some you know, conditions there and then a reflective street address sign shall be installed at the street in a manner ensuring visibility for public safety personnel. Um, what we do have here as you know, other requirements, um, you know, I have seen some communities try to regulate the number of bedrooms in an ADU. Um, some, you know, one or two communities are saying it shall be equal to or less than the number of bedrooms in a principal single family dwelling. One community just says it can be no more than two bedrooms in an ADU. I, you know, I, I think they're trying to get at regulating the number of occupants. Um, by doing that, I don't know if it's necessary. Um, we could say something specific to Title V, but we have that provision that it has to meet other applicable codes. Um, some communities get pretty strict about exterior stairs, that they're not allowed or they shall not be visible from a public way. I don't, you know, if by code you need to have an exterior stair, depending on where your ADU is, are you really going to not allow it? Um, we could do something about short-term rental, but I don't think it's necessary now. Um, some communities are, are saying, are doing this um, in terms of its location. Uh, we kind of have something similar in our bylaw that um, an ADU should not be located between the road and the front of the, you know, front of the house, the front facade line, basically like in the front yard. Um, or, or we could say, or it's allowed, but by special permit. And so we have allowed that in town already, you know, one or two ADUs in the front yard. Uh, and it is by a special permit, you know, it's been by a special permit. So, it, you know, the board looks at it, uses the design review principles. I don't know if we feel strongly about how we, where they go. Um, we could say that exterior stairs are on the side of the house. Um, you know, so there's a few other requirements we could consider. There could be more. Um, like I said, at some point, the state might say some of these are unreasonable. So is it unreasonable to say that exterior stairs can't be visible from the public way? Maybe, is it unreasonable to say that at least has to be on the side of the building and not on the front? To me, that's probably more reasonable than saying it can't be visible at all. Um, so, you know, look this over. If you have other ideas, send them to me uh, and we can continue the conversation. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I, I feel like there's probably more things you could, we already have 19, <laughs> 19 requirements. Um, you know, a lot of them are, to me, pretty straightforward and not that onerous, but. Okay. Um, let's uh, take a couple of public comments. So Pam, can you bring over Taryn LaRaja? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Please give us your name and your street address. Uh, Taryn LaRaja, 7 Strong Street. Thank you. So um, basically our main concern, our neighbor's main concern is about cars um, and how parking lots and just cars are changing the feel of our neighborhood. Um, and I noticed that it talks about a minimum one space, but what about a maximum? It just, that's honestly more a concern than the minimum parking parking space, but a maximum because, you know, we don't want backyards in our neighborhood paved over with numerous cars and lights shining on so people can park their cars back there. Um, and, you know, I, I, the other question I have was about like, we do have bus stations in town. We, there's a, a Peter Pan stop right in town. There's a Peter Pan stop at um, UMass. And so 
it just seems like that is really a big concern because cars and parking lots and the way cars are being parked all over Strong Street and East Pleasant Street has really already changed the feel of the neighborhood. And that's a really big concern. So um, I guess I was just wondering if there's some way of talking about uh, or putting in there like uh, something about a maximum number of spaces. Okay. Nate, another thought to think about. Yeah, I will say that, um, yeah, the, uh, you know, law coverage and other um, dimensional standards would apply. We do ask that they submit a management plan and parking plan to the town um, with an ADU. It doesn't necessarily cap, we don't have a maximum. So, but the idea would be that they have, if they say they need seven cars, they have to show how they can provide, you know, parking for seven cars. It could just be all stacked in the driveway. Um, but yeah, I yeah, mean, for putting, I mean yeah. we often want to make sure there are enough parking spots just to keep people from parking on the, the lawn or on the street. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I understand what they're saying. I, um, and so, yeah, I mean, we could get at it a few ways, a maximum number of parking spaces. We could have um, a different lot area requirement for um, properties with ADUs. But again, you know, we don't necessarily do that for like a duplex. We don't, you know, have some additional lot area or, you know, a less lot area because you have a two unit, um, you know, structure. So, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd have to, I'll, I think it's a something to consider. How how can we regulate that? Yeah. Okay. Um, Karen, I see your hand, but uh, we had Bruce Car Carson uh, ha before that, so I'd like to I'd like to get through the public if we can first. <clears throat> uh, Pam, if you could bring Bruce over. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Yes, hi. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bruce Carson. I'm at 8 Strong Street. I'm one of Taryn's neighbors, and I'd like to echo what she said about the concern about parking. And it seems to me that one way you could possibly get at this would be, as you just said, Nate, a few minutes ago, as some towns are doing, perhaps not allow more than two bedrooms in one of these accessory dwelling units. Because I think what our big concern is that a, a landlord, since it's not owner occupied any longer due to the state law, a landlord could build an accessory dwelling unit, have four students living in the main house and four more in the accessory, and then suddenly you need eight parking spaces. And that's an awful lot of spaces on a small lot. Um, so if there's some way of, of trying to limit the number of people on the lot, that would also affect the parking requirements. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Um... So Pam, let's now um, let's bring Jennifer Taub over, and then we'll end with Taryn's second comment, I guess. Oh, hello, um, Jennifer Taub, uh, two fifty nine Lincoln Avenue, and I'm speaking uh, as a resident. I hadn't planned to speak, but I did want to echo what the two previous um, speakers uh, shared as a concern, because, and I I share that concern very much. I think we have not had that many accessory dwelling units built in town since we passed the ADU bylaw. I, I think maybe regrettably, but I, I now that, and there has been a lot of interest I understand expressed since the new state law passed because there is not the owner occupancy requirement. So I think we have to assume that most, that many ADUs will be built so that they can be rented to students. And unlike families and other non-student households, it, the experience in my neighborhood is that there are as many cars as there are residents. And I think the, the concern um, about having a parking lot next door uh, is, is really something that, I mean, that's a, a huge concern, you know, both in terms of, you know, looking out over a parking lot, the cars coming and going late at night into the early morning hours, the light, the activity. So I think particularly in Amherst, given what the reality of this bylaw is gonna bring us that 
anything we can do to reduce the requirement, the number of cars that will be required and parking spaces is, I think, a, a, a top priority. I mean, it's it's really important. And I agree with what uh, Bruce said on the, um, uh, what excuse me, what Fred said, that we don't, we should really try not to go beyond and provide more than what the ADU bylaw is requiring us to provide, because I think we have to be, you know, just really upfront about uh, what's going to be built uh, now that the owner occupancy requirement has been lifted. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess I, you know, I wonder what the, how the attorney general would, would view those kinds of restrictions uh, given that the intent of the law is to allow more housing to be built. So is it a reasonable uh, condition to be essentially limiting the amount of housing that can be built? So uh, it's more to come. Um, I guess, uh, I guess I'm, I'm still seeing two hands from the public, uh, Bruce Carson and Taryn Laraha. Uh, I assume your hands are up because you want to say something else. Um, and if that's if that's the case, keep your hand up. Uh, Bruce's went down, so let's bring Tara Taryn back for a short second comment. Um, I, I don't need a second comment. I I totally. Um, Car Karen, oh. I was talking about Tara. Oh, sorry, Taraha. sorry, sorry. We'll get we'll get to you. Pam, can you bring Tara in over? Yep. Uh, hello, Tara. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I just had one follow up, and it basically talks about what Jennifer was saying. Um, you know, this idea that every person needs a car is something we need to question because, I mean, we sh we have one car in our our four bedroom house here and the you know most families would have one or two cars probably two but the idea like what's happening now is that the assumption is okay there are four four people per home per home allowed that there are four cars and i think that really needs to be questioned and stopped <laughs> we yeah i mean especially close to town we we are not against density we're all for that but the idea that if you're living in town where you could walk to UMass, walk to town, and you still need a car, four cars, I mean, it's just, it's really gotten out of hand. And when we think about these additional dwelling units and one car per person, that to me and to, I know a lot of our neighbors is a huge, huge concern. And I really, really hope you take it into consideration because it's changing the, the quality and just the look of our, our neighborhoods, and we're not happy with it. Okay, thank you very much. All right, um, that is the last hand from the public I see. Karen, you're on. Um, no, I, I think that was so well said, and I totally agree with what uh, Jennifer and also Taran said. Okay, thank you, Jesse. Yeah, I also agree on both the points about bedrooms and the parking or limiting cars somehow. Nate, I think you said there are other places that are restricting to two bedrooms. Uh, and like, what happens if we restrict to one bedroom? Is that like, I'm just curious what we think the law is actually both around bedrooms and cars and what, what kind of flexibility or restrictions are we allowed to put in place? Yeah, that there's. Um, I think the limiting the number of bedrooms would be found to be unreasonable, especially if you went down to just one. Um, the idea is that you're not through zoning. You know, um, you're not supposed to regulate occupants or user type. Um, but you uh, did say other places are doing two. But... Well, they're trying, right? So, well, I forgot what town had two in there, two bedrooms. You know, the AG's office, if they voted at town meeting this fall, they might, the AG's office might say, no, that's unreasonable. So, you know, it's kind of like a wait and see. Um, the difference being parking doesn't necessarily reduce the number of occupants, but um, so I think that we could have some stricter parking regulations. You still then could have four, you know, 
four and four, eight occupants on a property, but you could say that, you know, you're only allowed two additional parking spaces per ADU or it, it's, it's really hard. We, um, the local historic district uh, has talked about trying to regulate parking as, um, it, um, you know, it's, you can't regulate use, you can regulate the aesthetics of it. And so there's been some proposals that are doing just what was described. You know, someone wants to put units in and they want to put a 20 car parking lot in a residential property. And so the, actually, if all those cars are parked there, it does become a visual feature that the local historic district could regulate. And we came up with some language about like six, um, a parking lot that has six spaces that is exclusive of a drive aisle and other things. Because for instance, you could just have a long driveway and you could fit 10 cars on there and that's not really a parking lot. And so it gets kind of really difficult to define, you know, how do you regulate parking? And so usually that's where we rely on lot coverage or other things. And so, you know, if I have a property that has, you know, a two car wide driveway that's 80 feet, you know, you could get a fair number of cars. Um, and you could accommodate everyone and you could accommodate eight tenants actually with that size driveway. Uh, and so, but I, I, maybe there's a way to do that, right? As opposed to going at it from saying, we're only gonna allow one bedroom in an ADU. I actually find that would be unreasonable. And then honestly, you could just do like a group quarter and every, you could have four, four people living in one bedroom, right? It's just a 400 yeah. square foot bedroom. I mean, so I don't think that that is gonna, even if we limit it to two bedrooms, they're just gonna double up. Right. Or, they're gonna or, make... or they're going to do two bedrooms, a playroom and a study. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I, yeah. I agree. It's sort of just semantics and it'll happen anyway. Um, but I but think I would be really curious to discuss how we can limit parking a little more. Yeah, but I think the parking piece is something that is. Um, could be uh, managed or regulated differently than, say, occupants. And so I think that, you know, those are comments that staff can discuss, you know, are there ways you know, do we even say that parking has to be, um, if additional parking, that's where the, say the one curb cut is important, or, you know, can you not add more than 200 square feet of lot coverage per ADU? And that's, you know, two parking spaces or whatever. And so we could try that, right? We could say, limit the amount of lot, additional lot coverage per ADU, and then they have to use what's there. I mean, then someone's just going to park on the lawn, right? I, I don't know. I, then it becomes an enforcement thing because their parking plan and man, management plan aren't being followed, but at least it would give us the town a way to try to enforce it. I mean, on some of the bigger projects we see uh, when the planning board, you know, will review something, the a landlord will say, well, I'll even say in my leases that some of these units don't even have parking spaces. I don't think we can require that in zoning, but it could be a discussion Right, like, okay, you know, I mean, I don't know, could we say that like, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. I feel like there's a few ideas I, I'm thinking about, but I have to figure out what's the best one. Um, I think we should try something and see if it holds up. <laughs> okay. Um, so anything else on that topic tonight, Nate? No. Um, you know, I, I sent it to you, you know, this afternoon so everyone can look at it. Um, like I said, I think if we just do that one accessory unit by right and the general requirements and the definition we meet the state law, you know, if we want to do anything else with special permit, we can, we don't have to. Um, and maybe it's better to wait for guidance from the state. Mm -hmm. um, and I do feel good that we have a bylaw in place so we're not, you know, if, February 2nd comes around. I know we're actually gonna get, I, I already know there's like half a dozen applications are gonna come in. So the ZBA denied a few applicants in the last few months that wanted to create a duplex that would be, you know, both units would be rented and they were denied. And I'm assuming, I don't know, maybe not, but I could see that those applicants are gonna come back now and do an ADU because, well, now they do what they wanted to do. They're limited in size, right? So if they were hoping to do like a 1200 square foot unit, now they can't be greater than 900, but you still could get the four tenants. I, you know, we've had inquiries at town, no one's ever said they're going to, but agreed that given the market in Amherst, you know, other communities have had similar concerns, right? Uh, Cape Cod with seasonal rentals, the Berkshire with seasonal rentals, they're worried that um, 
something will happen. That's why the state put the short-term rental thing in. You know, the students, you know, I don't think they considered students or the Amherst market for any, you know, for that kind of uniqueness, but. Okay, Karen. Is there, is there anything that prevents people from parking as many cars as they want on their lawn? I mean, I think parking restrictions and vehicle ownership is one way to limit the, the amount of uh, occupancy we can have, or at least have reasonable occupancy. Yeah, we require parking on an improved surface, improved surface. And so someone could start parking on their lawn um, you know, unless it becomes a complaint and then the town can, um, you know, investigate it and enforce it, but we wouldn't necessarily allow that. So for this, like if someone put an ADU and we limited the amount of additional lot area, and then all of a sudden there's six cars being parked on the lawn and the town receives a complaint, we would, you know, an inspector would go in and look at it and say, well, you're not following the parking plan. Um, and essentially you're creating almost more impervious because the ground will get impacted. And so you know, the requirement would be, well, you have to find, you know, those cars can't be parked there. Um, you know, they, you know, so you have to do you know, on-street parking, park somewhere else, you know, rent a space from somewhere. But yeah, I mean, we could, you know, that's how the enforcement would work it. Uh, but. So that seems to be something we should definitely pursue, restricting parking. Yeah, I yeah, I think we can come up with a few uh, You know, we might want to think about doing it as overnight parking. You know, just in case you want to have a some guests or something. Okay. Um I guess that that's it for accessory dwelling units tonight. And the time is 8.23. You want to take a five-minute break, uh, and then we'll come back just about 8.28 or 8, 8.30. Lawrence? Yeah, and I was going to say I, I, I need to drop off to do some parenting, which sounds like it aligns with a discussion of a project that I'm not a part of. So okay, thank you, everybody. Right. Have a good night. Good night. OK, come on back uh, by 8.30.
All right, I've got I've got eight thirty on my phone on my uh, computer here. So uh, looks like we've got most people back. Still missing Karen. Okay, we are we are back. All right. So we will it's now 830 and we can go on to the next item, which is item five general housing discussion. So as promised, this is the topic under which I think we should talk about the uh, let's see my There we go. Okay, um, so there we've gotten some outside email comments about this, the project that we uh, approved the site plan review, the, the sort of follow up site plan review for 4555 South Pleasant Street. And um, I know there's also been some comments from board members uh, that they think we should revisit that question or at least talk about the, the sort of issues that that whole sequence of events raised. So uh, I guess my, my, my opinion is that uh, 4555 was a project that was, you know, went through the process exactly the way it should. Um, it was duly advertised. Uh, the board, the packet was distributed to board members four or five days in advance. So there was plenty of time to review it. We had the hearing. We approved the site plan. We, we, we all voted to close the hearing and approve it. Uh, in the subsequent meeting, I made a motion to reopen that hearing, and we voted on that, um, and the, the motion failed. Um, we have basically the same people present tonight uh, as we had at that last meeting and that last vote. Um, I So I feel like it, it doesn't make sense to try to reopen that project um, and revisit that specific instance. Um, particularly because for all I know, maybe Nate and Pam have already filed the decision. I don't, I'm not sure about that. But um, it has raised the question about what do we mean by a residential occupancy? And, um, you know, we've got, I mean, I guess one, one thing I've been thinking about is that whether it's that particular project or some of the other multifamily projects in downtown, you know, we, we can tell from the unit plan that there's not a master bedroom and a couple of smaller rooms for kids or something like that. So they're, they're all equal in size. They look a lot like a student apartment building. Um, and so we've approved those uh, and, and so there's some, you know, I, I think we would all admit that there's probably a pretty high likelihood that there'll be a lot of students in there. And so one thing I've wondered is, is it a bad thing if suddenly the institution that those, uh, maybe that, that those students actually attend now has an, some skin in the game in terms of where they're living? Is that a bad thing? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. But um, whether that institution is involved or not, we've already approved that, you know, a project where a bunch of students could live. <laughs> so I, I, I just am not sure uh, that we need to go back and revisit things. Um, I think if, if we do want to get a legal opinion about what does residential occupancy mean, um, I will, I will mention that we still have the requirements for affordable units in multi, in multifamily housing 
that are that are mixed use. And you may remember that the project on South Pleasant Street was subject to those. They elected to make a payment rather than include affordable units in the building, which we approved. And um, so that's a that's you know that's that requirement exists and it doesn't exist for social dormitories in the RF district. Um, so I, that's that's kind of the opening statement I wanted to make um, and. You know, I'm happy to talk about this. And if we want to try to, if we want to ask Nate to go get some legal opinions, that's, you know, certainly something I'm sure he can do. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll stop there for the moment. And I see three hands. I'll start with you, Jesse. Thanks. Um, I, I generally agree with what you just said, that in reading some of the correspondences we've received about it, the one thing that's giving me a little pause in this instance, and I'm not suggesting we reopen it, I'm thinking about for future processes. The one thing giving me pause was wondering if this was a known plan from the inception or from some point early in this project, meaning that there was gonna be a single tenant for a long time. So I think you won't go into the details. It sounds like Amherst College has announced this is a long-term plan. It's not a temporary overflow. It's a long-term dorm they're planning to have. And had that project come in with that presentation, I don't think we would have approved it. I don't know, but that's, I mean, maybe. But if they said we're building a dorm above Hastings store, I'm not sure the conversation would have gone the same way. So if that's true and that's how this played out and they knew that and they presented differently and then they, Indeed, just slipped in. Oh yeah, by the way, we're changing this slightly because we have one term tenant. And oh yeah, Amherst College just announced for the next 10 years, we're gonna do that. That to me changes things significantly. I don't know how to avoid that moving forward, but I just wanted to air that concern. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Karen. Yeah, I do want to have some legal advice on this because if it's really clear that this is a fraternity and Amherst College advertises it already in their student paper as a fraternity, and by the way, they did say that this has been in the works for over a year, then we as a planning board can't approve it because the bylaw says you cannot have, excuse me, not a fraternity, a dormitory, in a zone that is not zoned uh, for, for this purpose. Now, I agree. I think that this is a, a good solution. Amherst College is going to take wonderful care of it, but there are things that we could require. It does not have to have a planned floor. And I think we can talk. I, I think actually the builder is, is open to thinking about this. Amherst College could decide, for example, that they want some real mixed use in that. In other words, that a young faculty person with children, they could they could still change the floor plan. They don't have to have a lot of single bedrooms and the space as it was, this, this Hastings property, Bruce Coldham kind of said, are you sure it all has to be these single student places because it's a pretty nice space. I think retired professors of Amherst College, some visiting faculty, visiting lecturers, could easily um, live there and that would make it a, a, a very attractive thing for the town and for Amherst College. I, I myself lived in a place like this long ago at Stanford, which had faculty, graduate students and undergraduates was very popular. That's the kind of building it could be. But uh, I think that we have to make certain requirements and we can't just let this slip um, without a legal, um, a decision, or at least the advice of it. I think that it was presented in a way that that was, they kept talking about transparency, but it was really only at the last meeting that it was clear to, to, to me that this was going to be one uh, lease and they wanted to get, and that makes it a, a very different building. You can save a lot of money by having not, you know, for each room, a separate uh, electrical outlet and and 
so they were transparent that they wanted to now have it all be one, but that came at the very end. And I, I am also wondering if this was something that they knew about and were working on uh, before that. Um, so I, I would like to talk about it more. Okay, thank you. Fred. Yeah, um, I've been struggling with this um, because I, I don't think it's properly considered as a fraternity um, situation. Uh, I, I think there was some discussion about how it's not a dormitory. Well, it, it, it kind of isn't. And one of the things that makes it not is the store. And I think it's probably, as I look at the bylaw, I think it's probably a mixed use. That's uh, how it was uh, permitted. Huh? I'm that's sorry? How, that's how the building was permitted. Yeah. And uh, one of the uh, conditions in the bylaw is that, uh, that would apply here, I think, is that uh, um, no more than 50% of the bedroom counts can be the same. Um, and and, and I, I, if memory serves me correctly, I think the building as permitted complies with that. Um, yes. So I, I, this, this was not handled cleanly, but I, I think if we think about it as, as mixed use uh, and really look at the, uh, the conditions in the bylaw, I think it, I think it kind of fits, uh, but it was, it, it, this was a mess, the, the way this, uh, I, I'm, and I, I don't know what we do about it now, but uh, yeah, there, there are some things here. But anyway, that's, that's my initial take on it. Okay, Fred. Karen? I don't think we are the ones that should be guessing whether this fits the bylaws or not. And is it a, does it, is it a fraternity or a dormitory? Those are two different things. I think you can't have dorm, you can only have dormitories. In, well, you, you, is that right? You're, you have, you have talked about fraternity, but then you corrected yourself to dormitory. Yeah. Is there, a, is, are, do you mean to say fraternity? No. Okay. So, no, it, but Fred was talking about fraternity. Okay. Okay. So, well. And the bylaw talks about dormitories. Right. But this was permitted as a mixed use building, as a commercial, you know, I mean, this is not, perhaps this is another sort of loophole that mixed use building definition permits, because we've obviously got mixed use buildings where it's basically a housing project. And then there's a hundred square foot office in the front or something that turns it into mixed use. So the, the requirements of an actual multifamily building don't apply. And that's an advantageous uh, approach to take in this under our bylaw. Um, so maybe this is another loophole or more generous avenue for people who want to do this. You know, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm willing to open about to talk about changing or considering changes to the bylaw. Um, you know, what uh, it probably gets into what do we mean by residential use and how do you limit that to people who are not all at the same institution and paying their bill through that institution. So it gets to ownership and that tends to get difficult to, uh, difficult to manage under a, a zoning bylaw. Um, so Jesse and then Karen. Thanks. Yeah, I tried to raise this last time. And I, I kind of do think we, or at least the staff, are the ones to tell us if it meets the definition in the bylaw. And so I, I guess I'm asking, Nate, do you think 
in the current description, this building with a commercial space and one tenant for how many units is it? I don't remember the number. One tenant for the 30 units or whatever it is, does that meet the definition of a mixed use building? And if we did want to change it, Doug, I think that's a place we could think about changing the bylaw about, I don't know if it's legal to say the number of tenants, right? I don't know. Right. But anyway, first question, does it meet the definition? I, I don't, I don't know. I'd love for someone okay. to say, yes, it does. It might not, we need advice. Yeah. So the building commissioner, you know, said it does. And, you know, I think it does for the reasons Fred and Doug has mentioned, uh, you know, and so typically, you know, and each unit is its own separate apartment, right? So a dormitory could just be that a suite style living and there's no kitchen in every unit, right? So essentially these were built or, you know, described as separate apartments. A social dormitory or fraternity doesn't necessarily have to have that provision, right? Essentially, it's like a large boarding house, which could have like a big common kitchen to serve the social dormitory. And so as a- And, and building, shared bathrooms. Yeah, and shared I'm bathrooms. So as a bathroom. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not questioning that part. I'm questioning the part about one tenant. Oh, that's, <clears throat> yeah, like or they this said- many, so, With as many separate units, right? With separate yeah. people that will be paying separately to the one tenant. Yeah, so usually, place, right? But zoning doesn't usually get into that type of of um, that level of occupancy, right? So, if, for instance, like I said at the hearing, if um, you know, say a private company wanted to rent those units from Barry, all under one lease, it would never have come back to the planning board. Okay, so that's all I'm asking. Is yeah. that, is that is, does yeah, that fit it, yeah. one tenant rents the entire thing that yeah. fits just it like does. the new one down on now on university yeah. it's even bigger if one entity wanted to rent that entire thing that would yeah. fit our definition of use still yes correct yeah. okay uh i don't agree that it's one tenant tenant uh <laughs> Uh, is uh, something that's very carefully regulated in the Massachusetts general laws. And this is not one tenancy, period. It is a whole bunch of tenancies organized through, in this case, Amherst College. And this is what I was talking about. This is the problem I had with the Daily Hampshire Gazette article. Uh, this is why... Uh, the uh and i was i was very insistent and the, the board was very insistent that uh the uh rental registration requirements apply to this and if if they can convince the reg rental registration uh authority that uh for some reason they can be exempt all right that's that's not our ballpark but tenants are the people uh, are the are the human beings in uh, the succession of uh, tenancies that will be created by, by this piece of property? It is not a single tenant. Okay, so it's a single person signing the lease, single entity signing the lease, a single lessee. This is they're That's signing. Better. They're signing some kind of a contract. It's not a lease. They're signing some kind of a contract to administer and uh, take responsibility for X number of of, te of tenancies. Uh, but tenancies are regulated in Chapter 181 in the general laws, and <laughs> Amherst College is not a tenant and never, ever will be. Okay, but there's some rental agreement. They're paying... Yeah, they're yeah they have a management agreement, and they've come to a business arrangement to uh, manage a whole bunch of tenancies that will indeed be uh, governable under Chapter One Eighty. I think it's Chapter One Eighty One in the general laws. This, this, those are the tenancies that that uh, involve natural people. That's who can be a tenant. 
Amherst College is not a tenant here. Yeah, Amherst College may be a, uh, a lessee from a commercial point of view, but they are not a, a tenant. It, yeah, may I mean, a, it may be a distinction we don't really care about, but you know, okay. just, uh, yeah, same question. If there's one lessee for whatever, 200 units, that still counts. It's still fine within our bylaw. We, we have no say over that. Just want to make sure that's true. We don't usually get into that. Okay. Um, you know, what I will say, you know, to Doug's point, and, you know, part of the housing discussion that of why we came up with the overlay you know, was the, um, there had been a proposal to describe, you know, a one family, two family, you know, then a new triplex, maybe quadplex and then changing apartments. But I think it's, you know, it's a, it could be a good time to look at, you know, all of our residential use classifications and, you know, do we want to change them or clarify some? So this fraternity, you know, it's fraternity sorority or social dormitory or similar use related to uh, UMass, Amherst College or Hampshire College. And there's three standards or in conditions in the bylaw. There's other standards and conditions for a mixed use building or apartment or others. Um, and so, you know, what you do is you try to fit something that will most closely fit uh, the zoning and the definition. And so, you know, a social dormitory or fraternity sorority is just not allowed where this building was proposed. And so it's only allowed in the fraternity residence district. Um, that being said, you know, it could be that we want to add conditions to the social dormitory that use classification. Um, we could add some standards and conditions to mix use buildings. It is hard to get into kind of regulating the end user. So zoning typically doesn't get into, you know, the type of occupant. Uh, you know, the you know, one thing that we we've done is we limit unrelated. You know, age restriction is something that um, you could do, but typically saying like, you know, no students or limiting the percentage of students becomes very difficult or limiting the number or, or requiring certain number of different tenants or lessees. I mean, all that stuff is not really zoning and it's in, um, we, the town probably wouldn't try to enforce it anyways, but if we would want, you know, I think Doug's question was, you know, looking at kind of our, our residential use classifications, you know, do you want to think about those? Um, you know, more broadly and then narrow down and focus on some, you know, uh, as part of this conversation, I'll say the housing production plan is underway. We're hoping actually this week or early next week, we'll have the needs assessment for the town and we'll have a draft housing production plan next spring. And I think, you know, that can really help this discussion about housing. Uh, you know, we're hoping in the next few years, we'll start a new master plan for the community. So that'll, you know, that's something else that's a bigger, bigger project. But, you know, I think as we're, you know, it's a really interesting time in terms of, you know, looking at sustainability and equity and, you know, carrying capacity of Amherst and everything, you know, what do we want to see as residential uses moving forward? I mean, I think sometimes we have these old zoning districts, even that hopefully through the master planning process, we determine might need to be changed, right? We have professional research park, which hasn't been used. We have Anyways, it, and I think sometimes maybe our residential use classifications need to be updated because, you know, they work, but now they're not working because of how things are being built or occupied. And so, you know, a lot of Amherst zoning bylaw is, you know, decades old, some has been tweaked or modified, but, you know, for instance, um, you know, the social dormitory thing to me, you know, would we want to change it? Would we want to, you know, or would we want to have better conditions for mixed use buildings? for the future. Um, and, you know, so that's something that we could consider, you know, do we want to be a little clearer about, um, you know, some, some of the occupancy requirements, I, you know, we can try it. We can ask KP law for information for the 4555. I think, you know, most attorneys will give deference to local boards as long as we didn't act, you know, act arbitrarily and capricious. Right. So we, the building commissioner advised staff, we went through, like Doug said, the hearing, we made findings that followed the conditions in the bylaw. Uh, and so, you know, KP law, the town's attorney would say, well, you know, unless there's something really egregious that it's a mixed use building. Um, but, you know, like what Doug is saying is let's think about how, if we want to move forward, are there other things we can do? Um, 
you know, if there's another 10 unit project that comes downtown and it's just say a, an apartment building, it's an apartment building, it could be rented by, again, one institution or, a, you know, one person, right? Someone could say, I would love to rent five of those units. I think they'll be great. I'm going to, you know, whatever. We don't usually get in there. We don't, the town doesn't say, well, you can't rent five units, you know, you can only rent one. And so it's a really difficult thing. The intent of, the intention of an applicant is really hard to get at. So whether or not Amherst College was having conversations with Barry or whomever, you know, they, most people wouldn't disclose that. So, you know, I staff the historical commission and, you know, we administer a demolition review, right? So, uh, you know, we can, we can issue up to a 12 month delay. So most developers will try to game the system and say, well, I'm going to come early to the historical commission knowing that, you know, I want to do something, but I don't have to tell them because it's really about the historical integrity of the existing building, not what's happening. So someone can come in and propose to demolish a building. Uh, we've changed our bylaw now so we can kind of get at what the future use is, but previously we couldn't. But knowing full well that someone's coming in to ask to tear down something probably because they want to put something else in, but they wouldn't have to say it. Um, you know that there's probably something there, right? And so it's really hard to get at why did Barry do this project? I mean, what I heard was, from the beginning that, you know, um, you know, Hastings, right. wasn't the business was, you know, was out of business. Right. And there was this opportunity to have some redevelopment. I didn't hear originally that it was, Oh, Amherst college was pushing this. It was actually, you know, Barry with the owners of the Hastings buildings and property came up with a, what they thought was a creative way to have a mixed use building downtown, you know, maybe after that proposal became public, Amherst College was like, wow, this is actually, you know, proximal to where we are. We like it. But, you know, I never heard that, you know, it was the other, you know, Amherst College was pushing it. But I'm not, you know, I'm not a part of those conversations. But from what I've heard, it was, you know, a private project that then was actually really attractive to Amherst College. I mean, it could, it was probably attractive to a lot of people. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess I'll just piggyback on it. We we approved a project that probably has whatever 80, 50 or 80 students. Uh, I think we all hoped that some of the units would be rented to some other people that are not students, but we we never had any assurance of that. Um, and, and a project that had a commercial space that we all thought ought to be occupied and, and productive for, for the town's vitality. So it's kind of what we still have. Karen. Well, I, I agree with what you're saying, Nate. I think that's exactly probably how it did develop. But uh, we do have a, a strict chart which does talk about occupancy and zoning. And one of the things it says is that you cannot have a dormitory in uh, an area that is not zoned for dormitories. And what I what what made me uh, question this was was Nate, you're saying it can't be a dormitory because it has that commercial space. How then are we going to protect ourselves in the future when the next building, which is going to be a UMass uh, thing where they sell their sweatshirts and logos and things, and they, in, in other words, anybody that we can then throw away that thing. And I think that town meeting put that in place to kind of protect the town so that we really would have mixed residents in town and not just students because students are not year round residents. They are not people that are going to fill the schools. We so badly need housing for staff, for workers, for people with young children. They would love to live in a little apartment like that if it was designed correctly. The problem that we have is that um, the profit isn't in it. You can always make more money sell, uh, renting. You can have higher rent because four students can pay more than one family can. And so we have a problem. And how are we going to protect ourselves if we take away this protection that you can't have a dormitory uh, in an area that isn't zoned for it, they can easily put a little commercial space in there and then have that. 
Uh, so I think we're well, in a problem. Well, I mean, we require the, what is it, 30% of the first floor to be commercial. We require it to meet our uh, affordable unit you know, our affordable housing requirement. It protect us. And Do so, you know, we require it to pay taxes. Um, you know, it's doing all the things that we've asked for. What's the problem? What are we, what, what's the harm that we're trying to protect ourselves from? I, I think it's actually a very pretty good solution for that part of town. I think a better solution would be if we, somehow we're able to restrict buildings being snapped by all students. And this this uh, zoning that we had to protect ourselves from dormitories was one protection that we're throwing out. Um, yeah, the harm is is that we're we're not getting a town with any kind of diversity of residents. We're getting a town that more and more the center on both sides, is dominated by single people that fit into those kinds of, of housing. And that's going to take a lot of uh, business impetus out of the town. And it's also going to make it hard for, for other residents to, to rent there. OK. Well, I, I'll move on to Johanna. Thank you. Um, I mostly I'm just trying to figure out where we are in the agenda right now. Are we in the general housing We're discussion? In the general housing discussion. Okay. It it seems to me like there's more stuff to talk about in general housing that people want to take up than revisiting this yeah. one building. I mean, I and I feel like we closed the public hearing and honestly I'm ready to move on. Okay. All right. Uh Jesse. And then Nate. Thanks. Um, yeah, Karen, I don't disagree. At the same time, until we have lots more housing, every new thing is going to be students, right? And at least I agree, this is a nicely designed place with different size apartments that when we get there in five years, when there's a thousand more units, maybe things will flip around and it'll become different tenants. But I, I don't think it meets the definition of social dormitory because they are separate apart, they're separate living residences. This is my understanding. I was trying to find the actual definition, which I couldn't, but anyway, that's awesome. Okay, uh, Nate? Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, Karen, what you voice is the concern. I, I think, you know, to me it would be like, okay, part of this general housing discussion is where, you know, where do we have other where do we allow, say, multi-unit housing that could be for mostly students? You know, do we look at other areas? Do do we encourage the university to build more on-campus housing? And is that a strategy we work through the town manager's office to discuss? Because, you know, you know, a, a, you know, a twenty-unit project here and a twenty-unit project there. We're not we're not going to, you know, as Jesse said, there's a really a big really big demand for housing, and so I think we, you know, to me, part of this conversation would be, okay, you know, we have a university drive proposal for an overlay. There's concerns about, you know, some of the properties on the Southern half, say it's only half the size, maybe we get a few redevelopment potentials properties, you know, are, is there another location where we'd want to have something similar? You know, how do we address the housing demand that's pretty unique to Amherst in the region, given, you know, uh, the five colleges and, you know, the university and, and everything. Um, you know, housing is a regional issue. I mean, sometimes I think, you know, at what point do we talk to Hadley or other communities? Um, you know, do we come up with a, a you know, a, a better regional plan? Do we work with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And so as part of this housing discussion, I mean, those are the things I think we can start talking about. You know, maybe then there are specific actionable items that we address by changing parts of the bylaw that could be okay. And then maybe it's actually coming up with other proposals like, okay, let's rezone you know, some other area in town, or, you know, it's really hard to say, um, there was a few articles um, a bit ago, um, you know, to trying to prevent students from renting um, housing units. So students aren't a protected class. 
but it's still discriminatory to say you can't rent to students. And you have to be, you have to be really careful how you would have a bylaw that says that. And so, you know, a few years ago, Boston Globe did a spotlight, like a three-part series. Boston has the same problem. You know, there's a lot of colleges and universities around Boston. Housing is tough. And an attorney said that basically they would advise against trying to do that, right? Because, you know, what is a student? Is it someone who is a graduate student? That is it someone who's older than a typical student who has a family? Is it someone who is still a dependent to their parents? I mean, it, it gets, I mean, that that's like something usually zoning doesn't get at, right? We just don't, we're not going to get into that type of who the user is in a household. So, you know, this attorney at the time wrote a, an article really saying it's really difficult to do that. But they had other ideas, right, in terms of like, can you allow other kinds of housing? Can you encourage different partnerships or other things? And I feel like that's where our housing discussion can go. Uh, the Housing Trust is talking about this as well, right? They are working on the housing production plan. They also finished kind of a two-year action plan. And so, you know, they some of the things they've been talking about is, you know, the impacts of students on the Amherst market, you know, in the, in the small region. So, you know, maybe at some point we have, you know, we could have a meeting with some housing trust with CRC and then talk about this. It seems like it's an issue that we talked about last year and the previous year. And, you know, maybe if we have a few good recommendations for the town manager or others, we could start presenting them. But I, I think that's where the conversation can be. You know, um, Johanna, to your point, right? Like we had the one project, let's extrapolate from that and say, are there other priorities or things we can talk about? I mean, I, I feel like there's, there's probably a lot. Um, but the student piece is really hard. We're, we're not, we can't put in our bylaw that apartments downtown cannot be rented to students, right? Or have some, we, it, you know, it's just, it's really difficult to do. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, I know that at our last meeting, there was a member of the public who is still uh, here tonight who wanted to have made some comments. Uh, so I'll ask the public members, uh, does anyone want to make a comment about this topic at this time? Uh, Pam, can you bring over Ken Rosenthal? Hello, Ken, give us your name and your address. Ken Rosenthal, 53 Sunset Avenue. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me speak. Uh, I'm sorry you didn't get a chance to see what I wrote this afternoon. I sent it to Mr. Malloy as well as you. I want to make a couple of points. One is Mr. Hartwell talks about uh, tenants. You expressly changed the name of the people who were going to be living in this building from tenants to occupancy at the meeting when you approved that. You'll look at your minutes, you, you look at the proposal, and you can see that's what you did. The other point is you're speaking often about building 45-55. Building 45 South Pleasant Street is a three-story building, which is occupied by the Amherst College store that used to be Hastings and some um, rooms above it that used to be apartments, maybe still are, and sometimes are offices. 55 South Pleasant Street is a totally brand new building. It's going to be five stories tall. It has no facility, no mixed-use facility in it at all, and it's not designed to have it. It's designed to only be residences. It's connected to the 45 South Pleasant Street by Mr. Roberts, but that doesn't make 45 South Pleasant Street part of this building, and it doesn't make this building a mixed-use building. There are other things I said in my in my um, paper. I, I don't want to belabor it. I've left it for you to see. I hope you'll reconsider this. I hope you will see this again. Put it on your agenda so that other people in the public can see that this subject is going to be heard and can be heard. To have it come up this way it means that only somebody like me who happens to have joined the meeting early and stayed on for a long time is going to be able to make a public comment. That's why I put my comments in writing and I hope you'll take a look at them and consider them. And thanks, Mr. Marshall, again, for giving me the chance to speak. Okay, thank you, Ken. Um, I, I guess I will comment uh, in response, Ken, to your, to your statement. Uh, at least my memory of the floor plan of the of the complex uh, is that the egress requirement th that neither neither half of the building could stand on its own and meet uh, the the egress requirements at least the circulation requirements of the building code, and so 
at the, the way they're designed at the moment, it is a pretty much intertwined single uh, complex. Okay, um, I guess uh, I'm gonna, I think that looks like it's about all the conversation on that topic for tonight. Um, uh, Jesse. Different topic. Okay, um, <laughs> all right, moving on. The housing, the housing production plan link that's on the packet is actually the definition of student home again. So I'm not sure if you wanted us to look at a housing production document, but we don't have it. Oh, thank you. So Nate or Pam, maybe that could be corrected, I guess. Yeah, there's no, um, there's no actual, you know, um, um, report yet for the housing production plan. So there is, you know, a survey, uh, you know, residents can take. Uh, there's information on the housing trust web um, website. You know, there's like a sub page for the housing production plan. Um, like I said, I'm hoping within the next two weeks, they actually have the needs assessment. You know, that'll be a 50 or 60 page document that will be sent around to the planning board and the housing trust for your review. We can discuss it in December. Uh, they're, the consultants are planning a pretty big um, public meeting or meetings in early January to go over the needs assessment and results of the survey. So you know, I think like January 7th, 10th, you know, a few dates in there. So um, I'll let you know as it, as it gets, um, you know, um, you know, confirmed, but yeah, so there were, you know, although we said a housing production plan update, it was more say, take the survey, you know, when the needs assessment comes out, it'll be a little reading. And then I think it'll help inform kind of this general housing discussion and the board's having. Okay. Um, did we want to talk a little more about, uh, next zoning priorities or have we talked enough tonight and we can maybe postpone that to the next meeting i'm not seeing anybody jumping into that that void so i'm going to assume maybe that's enough on general housing discussion tonight and we can move on jesse you're muted. All right, maybe a suggestion, which is, if you all recall, Nate sent us all the older plan about increasing density at already existing multi-unit uh, properties. I think that would be a great place for us to discuss, maybe mm -hmm. next time. Um, okay. So I'll try to take a closer look at that. Maybe others could as well. We can bring that one back. Great. OK. So earlier in the night, we went through old business, new business, form A's, upcoming ZBA, upcoming SBPs. I think we got all the way through planning board committee and liaison reports as well. So um, I think I, I don't really have a report of chair tonight. Nate, anything uh, from staff? Uh, no, I mean, I mentioned the housing production plan update uh, the downtown design standards, you know, still um, moving along. There'll be, again, some public meetings uh, in December. So, you know, stay tuned for that. Uh, and I don't necessarily have anything else that I can think of right okay. now. All right. All right. So I think we've gotten through our agenda. The time is 9.13. Anything anybody else wants to talk about before we close? Okay, uh, time now says 914 and we are adjourned. Good evening. I guess we're meeting again on, is it the 20th? Yes. Okay. Yes. See you then.